it's a joy to be here. We've got a marvelous uh, uh, international presence today because a uh, scholar from Cambridge University, Dr. Simon Gathercole, is here, and I'm going to get to introduce uh, or interview him. But instead of doing a normal interview the way I would, uh, I'm going to mix a little interview in with passages from Matthew that we're going to be looking at together. And I've asked to help me in this our own Dr. David Capes, uh, who uh, is uh, not just an extraordinary scholar and friend, but is also uh, still in the throes of writing his book on Matthew. And I figure every time we make him work on uh, the platform up here, it makes him work a little harder on his book. So with that, um, uh, let me launch our class with a short introduction. Here it is. Um, Jim Croce, in 1973, had a hit song, I Got a Name. And I don't know if any of y'all are old enough to remember 1973, and the danger zone is, if you are old enough to remember 1973, you may be too old to remember 1973, <laughs> if you get what I'm driving at. But for those who remember Jim Croce, who died in an airplane crash, I think in Natchitoches, Louisiana, after a concert, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Maybe the only thing Natchitoches, Louisiana is famous for. He um, uh, wrote this song, I Got a Name. And he's not talking in the song about Jim Croce. To some degree he is. He's talking about his last name that his father carried as well as him. Um, but, but he's talking about who he is as a person. And this, this word name sometimes gets too isolated in the way we use it. And as a result, when we read the Bible, we are prone to miss out on some of the substance of what's there. So in your Greek New Testament, if you were reading in the original language that the New Testament was, was written, you would see this word onoma, or look, I've got these great Greek scholars here, I want to tell you, I learned to pronounce Greek in Lubbock, Texas, okay? And I've kept it with me everywhere I've gone. So they would say onama or something like that. For me, it's still onama. Excuse me for that. In Hebrew, it's shem. And those are the biblical words that are typically translated as name, and it's an okay translation. Now, I couldn't do any better because it, it is name, but it's not name simply in the sense of a handle. So in the 1970s, while we're in the 70s, in Lubbock, Texas, there was a phase we went through called CB radios. Your kids are like, what? Think of social media before the advent of computers. And instead of sending an Instagram picture of where you are or a text message of what you're doing, you would get on a CB radio, which could transmit for, oh, a few miles, but not much more. And you would say, you know, breaker, breaker, one, nine, and you would give your handle so people would know who you are. You wouldn't say, uh, this is Mark Lanier, because that would be like pathetic. You would say, you know, this is, uh, huh? No, I was not rubber ducky. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, Grandmaster Lanier or something. You know, I don't know. Grandmaster rubber ducky. But, but, but you would have a handle. You would have a name. And people would know that was you. And typically it would be something affiliated with your life uh, uh, and not just your bathtub. So this whole idea of name in the biblical sense has a broader stretch, a, a greater semantic range than simply a label. And so if you understand that it's not simply a label, but it's also your reputation and your character, then you begin to understand some of the greater depths of some very important passages that talk about name. So when the Ten Commandments say not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain, it's not simply don't say 
uh, Yahweh uh, uh, haphazardly or at all. It means don't take lightly the character and the reputation of who God is. Don't, don't dismiss him. Don't write him off. Don't think of him as just a figment of your brain. Don't put yourself in his place. Understand who he is and respect who he is and what he's done. And that's what that commandment in a greater depth is, is, is urging people to do. Well, in the like way, we've got this in the New Testament, but you read throughout the Bible, if your actions and your reputation did not fit your name, they would change your name because it was that important. Your name is who you are and what you've done. Um, we use the word a little bit like that still. We can say, for example, Texas Tech has made quite a name for itself in basketball. We're not saying there, Texas Tech has created a new basketball handle by which we can fill in an application. We're saying it's reputation, it's, it's, it's accomplishments, it's resume or curriculum vitae. Uh, that's, that's the idea in name. So with that, I've grabbed some name passages out of Matthew with the help of, of Simon and David for us to discuss. So would you help me in welcoming up here uh, Dr. Simon Gathercole and Dr. David Capes. Please, gentlemen, have a seat. So, Mark, what was your handle? Uh, your I'm CB. I'm not sure. Handle? I was in like eighth grade, ninth eighth grade, grade. So, frankly, Simon, what about you? What was matter. your handle? I didn't have CB. Actually. <laughs> yeah. He's too uh, young for that. Yeah. All right, Simon. That. I want to make sure your microphone's working. Testing, testing. Houston, do we have a problem? Do you, you keep talking? Uh, is that we, working? Is that working? No, no. Keep no, going. Uh, keep going. Yeah. Now it is. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Simon, a little bit about you uh, uh, before we get too deep into the passages. Uh, you have uh, you teach at Cambridge University, like um, the Texas Tech of England. Yeah, sort of. Sort of yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what we say, that's what we always say. Yeah. 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 I, I knew it was probably pretty well known there. Um, I think I've seen some of those T-shirts. Cambridge, the Texas Tech of England. Um, what, uh, uh, where did you get your degrees, first of all? Well, I, I first start, I, my first degree was in Cambridge, so I started uh, in classics uh, and then did a year of theology uh, after that. And then uh, I did a master's and PhD in Durham University in the north of England. And, and did you grow up in a Christian home? Um, we were a sort of moral, moral Christian home in that sense, but um, we didn't go to church. Okay. And, and where was it in your life where you decided that this was more than just a convenient idea to live by? I think, well, when I, when I was a teenager, I was at boarding school, and uh, every Friday evening there was a, uh, a Christian meeting, which I sort of just drifted along to. Uh, initially, because some of my friends went to it, and it was a very friendly environment, unlike most of boarding school. <laughs> um, and um, uh, and I, over the over the course of those months, I I heard the gospel for the first time, and uh, and then I, I heard a talk about Revelation 3:20, "Behold, I stand at the door and knock." Uh, um, and uh, that was when I responded to to Christ. I, I knew that Christ was addressing me, and that I had to respond. Any challenges in your faith after that? Um, yeah, I think when I when I was just about to leave school, because um, I I you know my school had been my church my church really, um, uh, I sort of had a bit of a crisis then uh, yeah. about whether to you know whether I really believed this or whether it was really true. But um, the Lord was gracious and brought me through that. And and mm. so you get a degree in classics. Uh, uh, in America, that would be Greek and Latin. Is that what yeah. it was over there? Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, when did you realize you were pretty good with Greek? 
Well, the thing is, uh, being in Cambridge, I know that there are people who are far better at Greek than I am. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I have done it for, I did start it, you know, I was blessed to be able to start it at school at 11, at, when I was 11. Uh, and so I've done it for quite a long time. <laughs> Since you were 11, you've been doing Greek. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> um, David, when did you start your Greek? It was in college, yeah. My first Greek course, I was at Mercer University in, in Atlanta, and uh, I started, that took my first Greek class there. Took a second Greek class, pretty much the same thing, just redoing it, uh, because I didn't feel like I got all the basics that I needed back in seminary as well. So did it a couple of times, and then got good enough to begin teaching it. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm not sure I know your faith story. How did you come to faith? Well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home necessarily. I was asked one time at, at, when I was at HBU, a faculty member there, um, why I was Baptist, you know. And I, I sort of started to say what you normally say, which is, um, well, because I believe this, that, or the other. But I thought it was a moment for teaching and instruction. I said, well, I'm a, I'm a Baptist because my mother didn't drive. And uh, it, so that elicited a story. Basically, my, my dad really wouldn't at that moment take us to church. Uh, my mom wanted to go, but so we, we went to the closest church. So we walked. So we did that on Sunday morning, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights for, for years. And my brother came to faith uh, a little bit. But my older brother came to faith. And then I think I was about seven when I confessed Christ. And I, I went to RAs and tried to be a GA, but they wouldn't let me, um, but, uh, which girls auxiliary, but, uh, no, all right, Royal Ambassador. Do, do churches do that anymore? I don't know. But it's, uh, that was very formative for me, you know, in terms of kind of my life trajectory. Uh, it was about mission education at that point, so, and right. football. We played a lot of football. And you were a baseball player. I was. I played a lot of baseball, yeah. You wanted to be a pro baseball player. I did. In fact, I did. I played, you know, for, 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 for two years second base with the Cincinnati Reds. Um, and then that, I went, then I went would... to middle school after, and after that. Some people in America would get that, but anyway. Very good. Um, oh. Yeah. That was not God laughing at your joke. That was the microphone. <laughs> that was um, the, uh, uh, so, Simon, you go to Cambridge. You get a degree in classics. You add another year for theology. You go to Durham. You ultimately get a Ph.D. or a DPhil, whatever they call it there, a doctorate. What was your dissertation on? It was about Romans 1 to 5 and uh, how Paul uh, regards observance of the law in Judaism and uh, how that relates to justification in Romans 1 to 5. Um, I, I don't, I haven't done this in dating with you. It was I, I would assume Sanders' new Paul was out by then and mm -hmm. so you were grasp, grappling with some of that as well? Yeah, so in the, in the late 70s and 80s and 90s there was what became known as the new perspective on Paul which was a sort of, I won't go into all the gruesome details, but it, it, it was a sort of... Uh, you know, revisionist new understanding of how we should understand justification in Paul. Um, Tom Wright will tell you more about that. Yeah, but Tom would say his is the new, new, new Paul. <laughs> okay, um, uh, we'll save that for Tom when he's here in a few weeks. And uh, uh, N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, will be here June 4th, uh, 5th. Uh, yeah, June 3rd, we'll do the panel discussion. June 4th, a lecture. Uh, we'll have the lecture. And then June 5th, he'll be in class, in class. with us. Um, okay, so gentlemen, I thought we'd spend a little bit of time. We've got a, a good 35 minutes that we could spend uh, uh, looking at some passages that use name. So we've got a monitor down here that shows you what the people out there are able to see behind us. Uh, you've got a portable microphone. If you need to go up there and point, go right ahead. But uh, uh, so let's start with Matthew 121. Uh, this passage is, uh, who wants to set this up, put it into context? Sure, so this is how, well, this is how Jesus gets, uh, gets the name that he's, that he's given. Um, uh, Joseph is, 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 uh, having a, is having a dream, he's told not to worry uh, um, um, by, the, uh, um, by the angel, and 
he's told that he's going to have a son or that Mary's going to have a son. Um, <laughs> and uh, this, name, this name Jesus uh, is the same, you, you may know, it's, it's actually the same name as Joshua in the Old Testament in its longer form, Yehoshua. Uh, the Yeho bit being the Lord abbreviation for Yahweh and the, the Shua bit being the salvation route. So it means the Lord saves. Uh, and so uh, this uh, promise, uh, the promise of salvation is contained in the name of Jesus itself. And specifically, uh, it, that Jesus will save his people from their sins. And where this is particularly, I spe- and this is something you, you can sort of track through Matthew's gospel as you go through, um, at, this, at this point in 121, as we're reading, we've got no idea yet how Jesus is going to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you imagine yourself as a, an innocent reader coming to Matthew for the first time, you, you don't know, you know is he going to, is he going to teach people how they can really observe the law carefully so they never break it? Is he going to give them a sort of special power, you know, to, to improve their moral fiber? Um, but as we go through, of course, we discover that it's through the cross that Jesus is going to save, him, save, save his people from their sins. And we, 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 we see this picked up particularly in the Eucharistic words in Matthew. So the la- at the Last Supper... Um, Jesus says, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And so that statement there in Matthew that Matthew really emphasizes uh, that the death of Jesus accomplishes forgiveness of sins points all the way back to that promise in, in chapter 1 uh, from Matthew 26, nearly, near, the, near the end of the gospel. Um, so, uh, and, and I may be misspelling the Hebrew here as best I can remember it. Um, Joshua is the Hebrew of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got the J sound, which is sort of a Y sound either, either way, but you've got the J, so we can mm-hmm. chart that. Greek doesn't have an SH sound, so the SH mm-hmm. just is the S. And you, you've got then Jesus as the Greek version of Joshua, but I want to make sure we're there. You're saying, Joshua, you can divide the name up into, in essence, Yahweh, the name of God. It's kind of an abbreviated form. That in that, abbreviation. We, you see it in abbreviated form, particularly in Psalms and place like mm-hmm. that. But it's, yes, yeah, abbreviated form. And in a lot of names. Yeah. yeah, uh, actually, uh, it's, yeah. it's Jehoshaphat. And, Jehoshaphat, yeah. yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, lots yeah. of the... Joash, lots mm-hmm. of the names. Not only is it at the beginning of, of a name, but it's also abbreviated at the end, like Jeremiah. Or Eliyah. Abijah. Eliyah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Elijah. So all the Yah names yeah. contain this patronym, this name of God, all right. the name of the Father there. So we're able to see that Jesus has got the Yahweh part, and then Shua is just the, the verb of saves. Fair? Yeah. yeah. So you shall call his name Jesus, Yehoshua, and then from where we started this, your name is your character, it's your reputation, it's who you are, it's what you've done, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, if we're looking at this fairly, you'll name him Yehoshua because he will be Yehoshua. Mm-hmm. But is it taking it too far to suggest that that is actually saying then that Jesus is the Yah part of Yehoshua, mm-hmm. that, that he will save his people from their sins? He is Yehoshua, not simply Shua, mm-hmm. or not simply something else. They put the Yah in front of it. He didn't, didn't name him, you know, Shua or something mm-hmm. to that effect. Yeah. Do we see here a reference to the idea that, that Jesus is Yehoshua? Well, I think, you're, I think that's exactly right. Yahweh. I think it at least hints at that. Mm. And what happens in the rest of the story is we see how uh, Jesus, who, who will bear the name Emmanuel as well, God with us, 
is seems to be more than just just a man, mm. right? He seems to be more than he seems. Mm. So I think it's suggestive, at least, of that. Yeah, this is like I mean, this verse is like a trailer for for the whole gospel, isn't it? So where where, yeah. where you get these sort of hints, um, and you, you sort of could could he be saying that Jesus is is Yahweh? Well, maybe maybe he means that maybe is is it Jesus Yahweh or was Yahweh going to work through Jesus? We, we're not quite sure yet. But right. There's sort of there's all, a su- all su- I think suggestion that's really and, necessary and it's to say up. at the minimalist level mm. is that 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 through Jesus, God will save his people. Mm. That's, that's kind of the least common denominator. Mm. And then the most common denominator later is going to be a, eleva- an elevated view of Jesus through the story. Mm. But you don't get that just at the very beginning. You get mm. suggestions of mm. that, mm. that is, as, and it's worked out through the gospel itself. Mm. Okay, uh, the, the lawyer in me is about to come out. I will confess right now that I have been on YouTube and I have watched some of the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. (laughs) I figure I'm allowed to do that because I'm a lawyer. (laughs) And it's so interesting to me because there will be little trailers or taglines before the video clips that I'm watching. And there are two sets of video clips that are put out. One set is put out by the PR people that Johnny Depp has hired. They don't say that, but it is. The other set's been put out by the PR people that Amber Heard has hired. They don't say that, but it is. And so you'll read these taglines and they'll say things like, um, Amber Heard exposed for lying so bad perjury charges may exist. I'm thinking, wow, something really eventful happened today, so I'll watch the 11 minute clip that never happens. I mean, you're sitting there saying, where did you get that tagline from? That doesn't belong here at all. But it was an enticement that convinced me to waste 11 minutes of my time watching a stupid video that didn't live up to the hype. (laughs) So in that way, we've got here a question. Is this a tagline where Jesus will live up to the hype or is this a tagline that starts a story that fizzles out and doesn't Mm. carry forward. Mm. And my question to you is, as we work through this, we'll see more, but give me in a nutshell, does this tagline correctly state what the gospel conveys about Jesus? I would say yes, but I think it's the whole of the first two chapters. I mean, everything that's said that sort of sets up the story is going to be, in a sense, uh, it's going to be exposed, to use that language. It's going to be exposed for what it is. Jesus as the son of Abraham. Jesus as the son of David. Jesus as the, the friend of sinners. All of that is sort of suggested in the first, and I think the rest of the story proves it so. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, when Jesus is, the night before he died, when he's explaining what's going on at the cross, uh, this is, th- that's, he picks up that theme of, Salvation from sins, de- dealing with forgiveness of sins. Um, the other, the other, the other sort of tag word in there is people. Um, because again, if you imagine Joseph hearing this for the first time, he, God is going to save His people from His. his oh, well, that's good news for that's good news for Israel. Israel is finally going to be redeemed. Um, and so, when you're first reading Matthew, we've just had that big build up of the Israelite genealogy, and so we assume at the beginning that. His people, God's people, are, are Israel. But as we go through, again, as we go through Matthew's gospel, we see the Syrophoenician women, belie- women believing in Christ. Mm-hmm. And then finally, in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, uh, Jesus tells his disciples to go out into all nations. So God's people will belong to, to all the nations. Right. Uh, so again, again, it's a sort of, it's a teaser that you don't yet understand in chapter one, ver- at the end of chapter one, verse 20. 21, but by the end of the gospel, you do really get it. So when you reread Matthew, you, 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 and there's, you see it all. There's sort of this, almost this anti-level too, because Jesus will say at a couple of points, I am sent only for the lost sheep of house of Israel. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, that's, that's what he says, but in fact, what he does and where it ends up is much, much broader than that. Mm-hmm. So whereas some people would want to say, yeah, let's just keep this to ourselves. The Gospel of Matthew is saying, no, it's to the nations, to all the people groups of the world, mm-hmm. all the language groups, like every tribe, every nation, every 
uh, every tongue, those kind of things. And that's where the gospel ends. It ends yeah. with Jesus commissioning his apostles to go <clears throat> throughout all nations. Right, exactly. <clears throat> okay, um, well, we're going to move on from this to the, the next verse, which is just a, a couple down. But before we do, um, Simon, can I borrow your Bible for a moment? <clears throat> I asked Simon to put it into context, and I found it interesting, uh, his Bible wow. <laughs> that's up here. <laughs> just, that's just a freebie you get sitting up on stage. <laughs> um, uh, I did not tell you that Simon is one of the translators of the New International Version of the Bible. Um, so, uh, right. yeah, he's... Uh, I, I brought my NIV because I knew that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I didn't. In fact, put... Simon signed this for me last summer when they were at the library. I, I think, think I did. I wasn't. Copy. I wasn't here last summer. Well, you were. You were on video. On video, yeah. But yeah. did you sign it? No, no. Oh, here. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. We'll do that. We'll do that later. Okay. Let's go two verses later. Uh, uh, the the angel says. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's not the angel, actually. It's, oh, Matthew, it's Matthew. I'm sorry. Commenting. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. I said angel. <laughs> angel was 21. Thank you. <laughs> uh, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And Matthew is, is there's a formula here that he's using to, to quote uh, prophets, and, and the formula becomes important. Let's. Put the formula up here. I think the formula is 122. Yeah. Um, and and there's there's reason I'm I want you to see the formula that Matthew uses because in a moment we're going to see a passage where he deviates from the formula. Here's the formula. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. All right, um, gentlemen, we've got another name for Jesus. Is this like a first and a second name? His name was Jesus Emmanuel Christ. <laughs> what, uh, what gives here? Explain, please. You want to start or do you want me to? Sure. Um, well, I think the great, the great truth here is that this is the incarnation. So I I Emmanuel is... is um, uh, is Hebrew for, you know, surprise, surprise, God, God with us. Um, so here we've got the other word for God. We've had, we've had, we've had Yahweh and the, 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 the yuck bit of Jesus' name. So the other, the, 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 the word for God in general in the Old Testament, not, not, not God's personal name, but the, the Hebrew word for God is El, E-L. And Imanu means with us. Um, Im is with uh, and new is we, and the, the sort of linking bit is ma. So imanu el, um, and so what, what this tells us is that Jesus is truly God. He's he's el, uh, and but he's also with us. So there, in an, in sort of one single word, you have the doctrine of the incarnation in miniature um, that God is, that Jesus is truly God, but he's truly with us as well. Uh, not, a, not, 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 not sort of in the distance. You know, if we take, if we take that seriously from its quotation from the book of Isaiah, Jesus really is the second Emmanuel. I always thought it'd be kind of interesting to have a book called the second Emmanuel because he is the second. But if you go back to the 800 years before the birth of Jesus, uh, there is this amazing story about the prophet and about uh, a, a war that's getting ready to take place, syro ephraimatic war, I think that's called typically. And there was a child, a prophetic child named Emmanuel that was there as a promise for the people of Judah that they would not have to worry in the long run about these two powers that were allying themselves against Judah. It was the northern kingdom, basically, in Syria that were forming an alliance. They were much more powerful. It was like Russia versus Ukraine. They were much more powerful. And so uh, the, the, the faith that God would be with them was seen every time that child was seen. Hmm. 
that name. Now, again, going back to the idea of name, the prophets were famous for using strange names for their kids, right? I mean, Loami, Loruama. Mahashal Hashbaz. Yeah, don't you know? He, <laughs> he was tortured for that, don't you know? But they, there, there was a message in the name. And so Jesus comes along, in a sense, the story, Matthew's telling us that whatever happened eight centuries ago, that great saving event where, where God saved Judah, he is now taking it to the world and he's taking it to the world through another Emmanuel who truly is the God-man with us. So I think whenever you see these prophetic passages, think of them as being sort of ratcheted up. Think of them as being elevated. Um, and, and so, yes, there was an Emmanuel eight centuries before. Child named that, apparently. But Jesus is named Emmanuel for a different reason and for a different end. So I, I like to think of a lot of these prophecies as um, a stone that gets thrown into the water and produces a ripple. And then there's another ripple. And sometimes even a third ripple. And the same prophecy can speak about immediate events that may be happening in the day of the people, the then and the now. Mm -hmm. But it's got a much larger application as it applies to the coming of Christ in the sense of a messianic prophecy. And some of those same prophecies will then be talking about also the second coming of Christ in some ways. Because you've, you've got the same rock causing these multiple ripples. And, and our tendency uh, uh, always, and it's a fair tendency, but it's a, it's a heuristic, it's a brain shortcut. Our tendency is to read and understand things in light of the way we think. Um, a scientist is going to understand things with a scientific perspective. Uh, a novelist is going to understand a better storyline behind it. Uh, you, you, you tend to approach and understand things with the thinking. The problem is our thinking today is in some ways very different than the thinking of, of the time of Jesus and the culture that was there. You can't understand some of Paul's writings if you don't understand some of the rabbinic ways of thinking because it's just different than ours. And, and we'll try and read it and it doesn't make sense. I'm thinking about the mountains of Hagar and, and Sarah and, and all of that stuff in Galatians. You know, it, it, it's very rabbinic in the way it is. So you get passages like this, and our tendency is to want to read it and say, well, wait a minute, how can Capes be right? How can that have been some other kid and, and still been Jesus? And we just need to understand that, that God didn't always function in a 21st century Western mentality mindset. He, has, he is much bigger than that. And, and, and his expression through scripture and through history has been expressed in cultural ideas and thoughts that go much deeper than just ours. Is that fair? At the same time, yeah. At the same time, you could also reverse that and, 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 and say that, that Jesus is, the, the, the gospel is the stone and the, pro, the prophecies are the ripples. Um, hmm. I mean, because after all, if you, if you read the epistles of the Hebrews, it's not, that, um, it's not that there are these prophecies which cast this Jesus-shaped shadow. It's Jesus who is the reality, and the shadow is, is the prophecy. Um, so so in, in a sense, it's the, 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 the gospel is at the center, and the, the, sort of, the, the prophecies are sort of ripples which point you towards that center. Yeah. Oh, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, Hebrews... The, the analogy that I, I like to use is uh, the Hebrews was written to uh, maybe a sermon reproduced in written form to, to, to urge people who had grown up in, in Judaism and then embraced Jesus not to return to their Judaism. It's always real easy when you meet Jesus or when you grow in your faith to sometimes revert back to where you were beforehand because it's mm. comfortable and it fits and, and it seems right in your brain because it's what you knew for so long. And so for the Jews that were in that situation, this, this, we have this written where the writer says, 
in Jesus has always been the reality. Everything else before was almost a foreshadowing. And it's like if you ha were in a room that was, was uh, a lit room and, and someone opens a door and they're approaching from the outside, but there's a light behind them, you would see their shadow come into the room before they did. And from that shadow, you might be able to tell, oh, it's a person. Oh, they're walking without the need of a cane. Oh, they're wearing a dress or they're wearing pants. You, you could tell certain things about them from the shadow. But once they walk into the room, you see them for who they are and you don't run hug the shadow. You run and hug them. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is the reality. All of these old things were the shadows that, that were forms that gave you an idea of who he would be. But now that he's here, don't leave him and go hug the shadows. Don't go back to what led you to him to start with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, that's, I th that's a good think analogy. that's good. Okay. At the same time, though, the Old Testament still t tells you a lot about who Jesus is. So, Without yeah, a doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It gives him in great detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not just this prophecy, mm -hmm. but a number of others. And, mm -hmm. and I think ultimately, you, you can't understand any Jewish festival without understanding Jesus behind the festival. You can't understand the ark. You can't understand the tabernacle. You can't understand so much right. without understanding mm -hmm. Jesus. Um, and I think part of the story is that God has been saving his people all along at various mm -hmm. sundry ways, right? The word salvation doesn't mean that you die and go to heaven. The word salvation doesn't always just mean your sins are forgiven. The word salvation may mean that the army that has been threatening you has now been, been, been decimated. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's a real-time kind of thing. So or the think disease of that afflicts you has now disease. been healed. Right, exactly. So all of these so, so. kind of, that's, it's a big field of meaning and, and interpretation. So the idea of Jesus saving, yes, it's about sins, particularly there through the gospel. But going back through Israel's history, God has been saving Israel many times over. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the chief and most wonderful is the exodus itself, the exodus from yeah. Egypt. With, with that. All right. So we've got name. We've, we've got a statement of God's character, reputation, who he is, what he's about. We see it with him saving his people, Matthew 1, Jesus, Yeshua, Yehoshua. Um, we've got it uh, here, Emmanuel, God with us. Um, uh, let's look at a third one. Matthew 2, 23. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. <laughs> this is, I love this one, uh, because it's, it's so, to me, so interesting. Uh, I've had students, I've asked students to do this. I'd read this passage in a class to say, now, now your assignment for next time is to go and find the place in the Old Testament where, where it says he will be called a Nazarene. And you can read in English from Genesis all the way to Malachi, and you're never going to see that. What's happening here, uh, yeah, they get frustrated. <laughs> the, uh, what's happening here is that Matthew is engaging in a, a wonderful uh, play on words that comes out of the book of Isaiah, Yeshayahu, the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1, that uh, describes Jesus. Well, let me read that. Can we read that? Yeah, let me, I'll Let's put take, it up here. Because I think it's important enough. Will Simon be offended if we use the ISV? Um, I'm not sure. The ISV? I mean the ESV. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Okay. He's a, uh, he's a basic 11 one. 11 one. Uh, there, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is a, understood by many as a messianic kind of prophecy. There's a picture of judgment in the Old Testament of the cutting down of a tree. And this, was, this came about, I think, because whenever there was an invasion, not only were, were men killed and, and women taken into slavery and children and such, but they would also destroy their homes and cut down their trees because the trees were the, the, the means by which they, uh, they fed themselves. It takes a long time for an olive tree to bear olives and do uh, those kind of things. So the idea of judgment and the cutting down of the tree, you see it over and over. And 
But when, those of you who are horticulturalists know this, that whatever you see above ground as the leaves and the stock and, the, and such, you got pretty much that same reality underground. There's a lot of energy in those roots. And from those roots comes up this netzer, this is the Hebrew word for the shoot branch, the idea of the netzer, uh, the shoot comes up, and before long, you see leaves there, and before long, it grows. Some of you have tried in vain to cut down trees before, and you can't do it because they keep coming back. That's exactly what I think the prophecy here is about. And those of us in Texas will remember back in 1993, a fellow named David Koresh, who had a group of people called the Branch Davidians, this branch idea. It, it was a very much a prophetic, apocalyptic group. Uh, we know the, the terrible things that happened there in Waco uh, in those days, but it, it's all centered upon this text. And so this became a very important text for understanding the idea of, of, of God's bringing about a branch or a part of the, the, the line of David, the line of Jesse, and bringing forth now this salvation. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and it goes on uh, to describe some of the, the roles that this Messiah will be taking on. Well, the word Netzer is of the same root as the word Nazareth. And so I think what, what Matthew is trying to do is to link Jesus' settling in Nazareth with this idea of Netzer, this this shoot that comes forth and forms this new tree, this new life that will be greater, grander uh, than, than the former. So it's, uh, I, I think that's what's going on here. Plus, Jesus will be known as a Nazarene, and the followers of Jesus will be known as Nazareans as well. I think all that is kind of at work in this particular passage, but it's found in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. It's also found, I think, in... Um, Jeremiah. Jeremiah as well. Yeah, there's yeah. sort of a cluster of them, isn't there? There's, yeah. there's Jeremiah, and especially in, um, and in uh, Zechariah, where, Zechariah, where yes. you have the branch uh, idea. And, and so th I think that's why Mark mentioned earlier that... Um, the formula. The for there, there, there's, there, there's a formula in, uh, in, in 118. Uh, sorry, uh, is it 118? 122. 122. Um, this took place in order to fulfill what was said by the by the Lord through the prophet, singular. Uh, whereas in this verse 23, we have so that what was spoken by the prophets, plural, might be right. fulfilled. In other words, it's not one particular passage. There's that one central passage. Right. But that it's a cluster of passages which all point to the idea of the Messiah being a branch emerging from the, uh, from the root. So I, I did the PowerPoint this morning without these men input, um, it looks like uh, uh, they both read my PowerPoint ahead of time. I, they didn't. We just did it. But I wanted to highlight the S on prophets and highlight the, the omega new ending of, of the plural on, on uh, prophet so, so that you would see that plural because it is very different than every other time Matthew quotes uh, an Old Testament prophet. He always does it in the singular, but here he does it in the plural because there is that wealth. And I think the core one is, is clearly the Isaiah 11.1. 1. And the Isaiah 11.1, 1, if you look back at it, the, the word shoot really is Natsar, uh, Netzer, and, and it, so he's a Netzarine. He's, 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 a, he's a shoot in that sense. And he's I from think. from Shootville. Yeah, he's from Shootville. And. It's uh, uh, um, next to Lubbock. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> Lubbock is the hub of the plains and it's uh, out there. But if yeah. we go to the Jeremiah 31 passage, it's interesting because it's actually translated quite differently there. Mm. Um, Jeremiah 31, verse 6. And if you look at it here, let's see if I can have it up there. Is that verse 6? Yeah. There shall be a day when watchmen will call in the hill country of Ephraim. Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. Usually when you see the word watchman in Hebrew, you're going to be seeing something off the Hebrew word shamar. Um, but here it's off Netzer. It's, it's the same idea. And so you've actually got it as a, a watchman 
beyond the other perspective, but it's, it's still that same root that, that grabs this idea of Jesus being uh, uh, that. And so if we go back, he would be called a, a Netzerine. He would be called someone who is a prophetic fulfillment of, of, of a multitude of passages that talk about what God would be doing in his people. Fair? That's a fair assessment, yeah, exactly. You know, one of, one of the big questions that everybody has to answer who wants to think about Jesus is, who was he? Uh, C.S. Lewis is more famous for a phrase that, that had been coined by others, you know, was he a liar? Uh, was he a lunatic? Or was he Lord? Because that ultimately, I mean, you can come up with maybe some other options. Maybe he was psychotic. But that kind of lends itself to the lunacy idea. In other words, was, was this somebody, there's no doubt Jesus existed. No serious scholar debates that. There's no doubt that these are, are clearly, the Gospels are clearly written by people with immediate, semi-immediate knowledge of what he did. The indications are there. And so then the question becomes, these people believed it enough to give their life for it. Their motive wasn't to get rich. Their motive wasn't to get famous. Their motive was nothing other than to share what they were willing to die for because they believed it to be true. And historically, so many of them did die for it rather than revoke it. Paul being a, a crystal example. But, but then the question is, who, who is Jesus? And, and it's a real fundamental question. And a lot of people who never address that question and just go through life, it, 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 it's, it's a pity because, and I say all of this because people watch this on the internet. I urge you to really engage that question. Who is he? Because these names are saying that he is God with us, that he's saying God who saves us, that it is God of prophecy, the God who is going to cry out to the people and point the way to God. And it's uh, just my plea. All right, one more passage we've got time for. Behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, this isn't the only time this happens in Matthew. There are two other times, uh, one with a Canaanite woman that we talked about recently in this class, this is one that I've put up here because I want Simon to do two things for us. I want him to not only explain to us uh, his perspective here, but you'll see the word Lord in the Greek is put in brackets. I don't have the text. And I want Simon to tell us why. <laughs> and I hadn't warned him I was going to ask him that. Go ahead, Simon. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Do you want, should I start with the brackets? Yeah, start with the brackets. Well, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the Greek New Testament, <laughs> which we just happen to have up here, you've got, you, you've got basically on every page lots of footnotes. You know, we're used to footnotes in the Bible, you know, probably a couple every page saying, uh, you know, other ancient authorities suggest and so on. But in, in, in the editions of the Greek New Testament, you get very, very detailed reports on what particular manuscripts say uh, about, the, about the text. And so, um, in this case, the Greek word kurie, which means... Am I allowed to underline it in the Bible? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, you get the Greek word kurie, um, which means, O oh Lord. It's the word kurios, meaning Lord, in the, in the form in which you'd use it when you're addressing uh, the Lord. Um, and uh, this appears in some manuscripts, but not in others. So if you look down to, um, yeah, verse, verse 30 there, um, you'll see that the text that they printed um, appears in, so in the bit after Tuxt there. Okay. TXT, yeah. Uh, I'm 
Hold on, I need glasses. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, there we go. So, text. so that, those are the manuscripts which do have the word Lord in them. So we have P45, which is a papyrus manuscript. Uh -huh. We have C. We have W. Codex Washingtoniensis. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, is... Family one. Family yeah. One. yeah, yeah, yeah. 33, and the, so, ma and the, and the majority, the, that Gothic M is the text that is translated in the King James, um, as well as Syriac and Sahidic, which is a dialect of Coptic. So those are the... And, and, and the reason why... So, so that's, that's probably the most likely original reading in Matthew. Um, the reason why some manuscripts miss it out, I think, is because there are other places um, where people just say, have mercy on us, son of David. And that's the sort of more familiar, uh, the more familiar form, I think, um, rather than with the Lord in the middle there. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it incredible what these people who translate our Bibles sit there and work through? I mean, this is a lot of work. Yeah, this is a lot of work for us to have the benefit of something like this. And so when we read the translation and it says, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David, they've, they've sorted through all of this by all of these rules and everything. You know, you think back about ancient manuscripts, and if you want to read a play from uh, Aristophanes or something, a Greek play from, from one of the Greek playwrights, you, you, you've got some manuscripts that probably date from the late Middle Ages, mm. and that's about it. But if you want to go back and look at the Greek New Testament, you've got thousands and thousands of manuscripts that span the ages so that you can meticulously compare and weigh and really ferret out in the way of no other ancient book I know of. Mm -hmm. Uh, to try to get to what the original would have actually been. I, I, I can't think of any ancient book where we even have one one hundredth of the manuscripts. Well, Homer is the closest. Homer? Yeah, yeah, and how many yeah. manuscripts do you think we have of Homer? I mean, there are hundreds of manuscripts of, of, of the... Yeah, so Homer is a, an epic poet. You know, the works were probably put together in the 8th century BC, but they're still a long... You know, you know, even the earliest papyri are still a long way after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. okay, so now you want to talk to us about this passage, uh, both of you, please. We've got uh, two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I find remarkable about this passage is that when you look at it and, and you look at it over against the Old Testament, is that the language of have mercy on me, Lord, mm -hmm. is, comes again and again in the Psalms. Psalm 4, Psalm 6, Psalm 41, several times, Psalm 123. So to say, have mercy upon me, Lord, this is like prayer language being addressed to Jesus, if you would, the language of the prophets. So we know it's addressed to Jesus because of the son of David tag that's there. But we also understand, too, in other places, if you go back to Psalm 123 in particular, which I think this is probably the closest echo of, uh, there, there, is, there is have mercy upon us as well, and, and we see the language here. In other places, it's have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, Lord. So I think what, what is remarkable for me is that this prayer language, we started off with Jesus as God with us, and now as we move through the gospel, we see that prayer language from the Psalms is now being addressed to Jesus for mercy, for a healing, in this case, healing from the blind. And, and that particular Psalm, Psalm 123 opens it begins, I think, I haven't seen it in a while, I'm just going from memory, uh, open, you know, open my eyes, Lord, or my, I lift up my eyes to you, and it's the blind men now who are using that, that language, mm -hmm. and of course, before it's all over, they have their sight returned to them. Simon, you get the last minute. Well, this is, this is, this is a, a great verse, again, for the, the two key identities of Jesus in Matthew's gospel and in lots of other parts of the Bible as well, that Jesus is the human descendant of David. Um, so he fulfills that messianic destiny of being son of David and, uh, and bringing God's rule uh, on the earth. Um, but he's also Lord, uh, which 
in the Old Testament is the is is the translation of the, the name of God Yahweh. So uh, again, this is this is a bit like the Emmanuel passage, but even more so uh, because you've got Jesus being God, but also the fulfilment of the human uh, promise uh, of a son of David, a Messiah. And so I'll end it with this: Matthew twenty-one nine. Jesus is in his triumphal entry. The crowds uh, go before him, shouting, Hosanna, save, we pray thee, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Jesus comes with the reputation, the authority, and the deeds in the name of God himself. And so uh, we can say, save us, we pray thee, um, which is Hoshanu. Uh, in the Aramaic. So um, with that, I want you to join me in thanking these two gentlemen. Um, I want to tell you that you just got not only great American education, but you can now say you've studied Christology under the top Christology professor at Cambridge <laughs> University in England when he came to your house to give you personal tutorized instruction. <laughs> and you can say uh, that with a smile on your face and truth in your heart. Next week will be our last week in Matthew, and I'll be dealing with problem passages. Brent has sent me two he wants me to deal with. Uh, Ann Young sent, told me one she wants me to deal with. So if you've got any that you want me to look at next week, if you'll shoot them to me. I'm not saying I've got all the answers, but I sure can describe a problem. And so uh, we'll look at them together. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, let me bless you in the name of Jesus. Father, we do pray your blessings upon all who hear this message, that you will uh, quicken our hearts and our brains to, to learn more about you. Father, all we seek is truth in this world. That's all we want. But we come to you and ask you to reveal it to us. And we pray in the name of Jesus, by his authority, by his deeds, by what he's done, we approach you with confidence. Amen. Amen.